Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. And this is episode number 317. That's 317. That's 317. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to hear. How am I feeling? Hmm. Pretty, pretty all right, to be honest, all things considered. Um, You know, I think the, the realisation that this is the new normal has set in weeks ago. I don't think there's any... There's going to be any kind of new revelation. There's not going to be a point where I break down in tears or I just hit my head against a wall or something. That's not going to happen anytime soon. So this is the new normal. Getting used to it. It is what it is. And apart from that, I'm feeling pretty motivated, man. I've got a good little free mile running today. At pretty helpfully for the most part. Did all the things that I need to do in order to ensure that I'm, I'm setting myself a good little tempo to go forward, you know. Because usually Mondays are a great time to restart and rejig and do the things that you wanted to do previously that you haven't done. Um, take that as a good opportunity. I'm not allowing this lockdown to turn into that thing where all the days start, you know, blending into each other. I don't think that's a good way to kind of go about things. You know, it's, it's a difficult thing to to do, to get motivation to do anything during this time because we're all going through a fucked up situation, right? We're all in, a, we're all kind of confined to our homes and possibly doing things that we don't want to do or having to reconcile with things that we probably didn't want to confront i understand that but if there's any kind of control you can maintain it has to be you know the control of maybe going to sleep at a certain time waking up at a certain time ensuring that you do certain activities on a certain day that's really important just so you can keep some level of sanity and you can keep some kind of level of self-control too um and uh, autonomy i'd say in that regard because i think that's what i think i think i've definitely heard that about people that are in prisons like uh, prison stories where um a prisoner will basically stand up to the prison especially somebody that's been wrongfully convicted they'll take us opportunity to they'll take every opportunity possible to um kind of separate themselves from the herd right to kind of stand out from everybody else whether that's you know taking your time and getting ready whether that's eating a certain way working out reading there's a certain things that they do just to so just so they can maintain just so they can maintain some level of self-control in an environment where you're kind of stripped of any kind of personal identity you're referred to as a number you've got a uniform any kind of um, individual markers that you have are sort of stripped away um you know of course so that they can maintain their rule of law but if you're able to fight against that you usually come out of it better and again i have sympathy for people that can't do it i understand it's difficult to kind of have that kind of mindset now because we're all going through this fucked up situation but it's a part of me that thinks you know what this shouldn't really be an excuse you know this should be a ripe opportunity for you to try to kind of wrangle you know wrangle your life together get stuff in order um and try and set up some good habits so that when you come out of this you're in a much better place and again i'm you know i'm I'm still a work in progress myself i'm still having my ups and downs but i'm trying my best to do that so that when things end i have a good base and a good standing point because you know it's kind of similar to the whole summer body thing in it you try and work out as much as you can before the summer hits so that when it hits and your motivation is low you've already got a good base to kind of work from as opposed to getting started in like you know june or some shit it's too late by then but yeah um things are going okay things are going well it is what it is isn't it oh the camera's not being leveled out here but hey what can you do um what else has happened uh, blah, 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 blah. oh the dominic coming thing has been really interesting isn't it come gate what an appropriate name for an absolutely you know unavoidable avoidable yeah unavo- an avoidable catastrophe from somebody you know who you'd think would have a little bit more foresight in Dominic Cummings, right? Somebody that was instrumental in crafting the Leave campaign. He couldn't see this coming. He couldn't see the trouble he'd get in for. Alleged, no, allegedly, he actually went to visit his parents because he was afraid that there'll be no one to look after his young children and his wife was ill. You know, you can read the story online. It's a flipping shit show. Then he decides to sit down in Number 10's garden and have a little impromptu conference, press conference, which he probably should have done when the story broke. This is one of those occasions where you sometimes think to yourself, you know, these guys... They can have moments of utter brilliance, right? The Leave campaign, you know, whether or not you're a Remainer or a Leaver, whether or not you, you're opposed to um, the slogan 
or the goals that uh, that were set there and you're a remainder you have to admit that league campaign was pure genius right from how they stoked the division within the country exploited it had a clear messaging without any kind of real substance towards it that then led into victory like it was kind of genius um marketing placement uh you know sewing discontent like it was a perfect psyop operation right they smashed it so for somebody that was so instrumental in that whole entire um rollout to get this completely wrong it just makes you think like are these people as smart as they kind of lead you to believe or is it just all or, or are we more or are the british public um more to, to blame for the fact that you know we are out of the eu now like who is to blame really these masterminds or us for being dumb enough not to see through some of their um you know misgivings but jesus man what a, what a shit show i think this all could have been avoided really not not really because i think dominic Cummings is much like a lot of like um a lot of celebrities who get caught up in these um you know uh who get caught up doing something wrong in public and then essentially try to get cancelled at the root of it people just don't like this guy right they want any excuse to get rid of him you know kind of cancel his life you know make sure his kids go hungry and his wife doesn't have a roof over their head right they don't they want him to kind of like die essentially right they hate him that much you see it from the vitriol or some of the questions of the journalists like it was really impassioned like they really despise this man so i think he suffered from that so when you suffer from having that kind of level of self perception from the public where they just don't like you as a person you have to always come on the front foot you can't let things just like drone on in the background because you won't be given the benefit of doubt no one's going to give that to you because they don't like you they hate your guts so if you would have come out straight away when the story leaked and just kind of put everything on the table it would have been far better but the nature of politics doesn't necessarily call for that does it it's not necessarily an arena or an occupation that calls for you to be honest and for you to like say things as they are right the whole point of politics is you know to kind of leave stuff out make things vague um you know play up to us uh, play up to you know the public sentiment um underplay some things to your advantage overstate some things to your advantage play people off against each other but there's no real um consistent uh thread of kind of being honest right with your constituency honest with the public at hand honest with people that vote in power that's not necessarily a thing that happens which is odd isn't it considering you know some of the people that you know who make up the british public are going to be fans of you right fans of your party people that actually voted you into power so you'd think you'd maybe owe them something an explanation so that you know they're not having to like fight your battles for you because that was a weird thing he didn't say nothing about all these mps having to come out and back him and it's like i'm not backing anyone that's not gonna back themselves do you know what I mean? that's just really weird isn't it that's some super like cuckery white knightery behavior isn't it like backing somebody and you have no idea what the facts are because imagine if it comes luckily those mps didn't say you know anything too mad but imagine if the facts came out and he actually did take the piss which you know he evidently did but imagine if it was worse than what um he described in the press conference how dumb would you look having gone super hell for leather for him and then actually it's turned out to be something that's like really serious so he doesn't say nothing he tries to kind of do the whole ignoring ignoring it until it goes away thing which you know if ever there was a moment where that kind of strategy doesn't work it's now because everyone's at home look at what's happened to doja cat right she has to make a statement because it just kept going on right people just drumming on and on about her being in alt right chat rooms it's just you can't ignore things now because everyone's at home on their phones on social media you have to address things head on so he finally addresses it he finally speaks about it and you know f fair enough you know the story's full of holes the bit about him you know feeling like his eyesight was bothering him so he decided to go for a drive in order to kind of test it was absolutely insane it reminds me of the you know the classic line of um what's his name prince andrew you know with the peace express in woking right um just a complete shit show in terms of how he presented himself um you know he got a bit ratty for a minute he kind of blamed the media for spinning the story out of control which is nuts because you know he gave them he he's being a being a quote not a spin doctor but being somebody who who knows how the media works he should have been aware that the more time or the more space he gives in between the story leaking and him answering they're gonna fill in the blanks and make up any kind of you know stories or rumors or and do what the media does so he shouldn't be surprised by that but yeah man i just 
you look at it and you just think, fuck, and then, you know, the distraction with, you know, lockdown in the UK hasn't been necessarily, a, you know, hasn't been the, a stellar performance from us. Brits has to be said. We've kind of flouted the rules um, for maybe the best part of three weeks. Now people have been going out and fucking it off and no one's really been caring. Um, the social distancing rules have kind of not really worked that well. People, in especially my, my area, people are passing each other, you know, and not really, you know, crossing the road as they were previously. There's a lack of people wearing masks and stuff. So if you do want to encourage the public to take more ownership and to maybe take the thing more seriously and abide by the rules, you what you don't want is your leaders, the people in power to be taking the piss because it does look like, you know, it's one rule for them, one rule for us, which, you know, which evidently, you know, is true. I think, right? But you don't want it to be true in this regard. Of course, there's going to be occasions, you know, if they get involved in some sort of legal dispute, you know, he's not going to prison, right? If he goes, gets caught up in something, right? He gets caught taking a couple of bumps in the toilet, hooking up with a prize or something. He's not going to lose his job. He's not going to get going to prison by, you know, more often than not. But you don't want, you know, when it's something as basic as like stay indoors, don't go near elderly people, don't drive unnecessary long distances if it's not to do with shops and all this sort of stuff. Just basic rules that we all know about. For him to flout it and then to kind of, you know, get angry that he's been having to ask to explain himself is really bizarre. And then another thing as well is like at the end of it, it's just like, what's with the inability for politics? Again, I'm not, I don't follow politics at all because I just think it's, you know, it's, prob- it's 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 incredibly boring and um there is little to no resolution for us as you know as voters to really get involved because but what change can we make really right we're reduced to like three parties two in some cases to vote for some of the policies that are in place don't necessarily uh, you know affect or benefit you directly so it's just a complete waste of time especially in britain anyway i think most but most people probably feel like that but just in terms of just um how they conduct themselves as a public like the inability to just say i'm sorry it just is really striking like because he could have said anything he said and just came out and said look i'm really sorry i made a huge mistake i made a call a, a kind of a an error in judgment but i thought i was in i was in the rules because if he would led with i'm sorry but still explain that he thought he was in the rules as you know per the rules that he read it would have been fine i think i think it would have taken a lot of sting out of it but it's just a uh, it's just a sense of contempt that you feel from these people when they speak to the public who have to answer to their, for their misgivings, answer for their errors and their mistakes and their missteps. It's just like, why, why do you feel contempt for us for having to explain it? Like, you know, you essentially work for us and then you're feeling contempt for having to explain yourself to us. It's really bizarre, especially in the UK with the Tory party. Like, you know, they have a very large, um, you know, support base with working class people and you sometimes think, why is that? When they quite clearly, you know, wouldn't you know they they wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire for real like they absolutely have got a lot of contempt for the british public which is interesting again maybe he's got a point because you know he's getting pelters at home and stuff and his families are probably getting you know family members of his are getting death threats and whatever it may be but <sighs> what a bad way to handle it man he handled it really really poorly i think in my opinion but hey um let's see if it rumbles on they want him to get they want him to resign it's not going to happen these guys you know they they hang around like a bad smell they are they're they're essentially the political version of like you know dark side feel nothing can destroy them they just keep going on and on and on and on and on they're like cockroaches man they just morph into other things or they just harden up and just you know bunker in their friends gather around them because they're all you know they all kind of scratch each other's back and nothing really changes so you know don't waste your time getting upset about that if i was you and then what else um let's move on so what do 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 this is something that I've kind of observed from the outside, mostly based um, around uh, the release of the chunky donkey SBs that came out the other day, right? Um, I think a few people got L's. I know I did. I knew, I knew into the couple of raffles anyway. Raffles are probably one of the most annoying parts of having to be involved in streetwear, I think, in general. The idea that you have to kind of, you know, get into a competition for a chance to buy something. The fact that some of these stores use this opportunity to kind of data mine and gather email addresses and get you to sign up for nonsensical fucking newsletters about releases of shoes that you can buy in 17 other stores just around the corner from where you live is nonsensical. The fact that they ask you to do these crazy things like repost stuff and put stuff on your IG feed is just really, really gay. I hate everything about it. It's really annoying. Um, it's cool 
corny as fuck and I just you know I despise everything about it but if it's anything to do with just you know entering an email address so you just enter the raffle I'll do it anything that requires you to do a task or something right go outside and clap your hands you can you know you know I have not got no time for it so Chunky Dunky you know evidently called for a lot of that I guess you know they had to do something because you know the theme around the shoe was quite interesting novel idea you know with the Ben and Jerry's collaboration I get it make it a bit fun take the you know seriousness out of it but in general it was just a chance for most res- it was just an opportunity for resellers to really cash in and make some good money and I've heard you know that these shoes are going for like what a grand or something like that on StockX I've heard let me see if that's actually true Nike Dunk SB Chunky Dunky stock X, I see how much they're going for. But supposedly they're going for like a grand. Which wouldn't surprise me. They kind of they kind of give me the what the dunk sort of vibe for this generation, it seems like, right? That's the sort of vibe I'm kind of getting for them. So that might be a fact that they're going for that much, you know, different patterns, colours, a Ben and Jerry's thing. Cause I think a part of me is like if they didn't have an actual Ben and Jerry's you know, a logo on them or just a Ben Jerry's inspired colorway, they probably wouldn't go for so much. But I think because the fact that they actually got the, you know, Ben and Jerry's actually written on them, it's, uh, it's a big look and the pony hair and stuff. Yeah. So if you're looking on the screen, they're going for like a grand 300. That is a lick and a half. And if you've copped them for like 90 quid, which I think is a price that they probably set out at about 90 in it, right? I'm sure it's about 90. Bumba rotted. That is insane. So yeah, um, you know half decent shoe it is what it is really nothing really to write home about if you're a sneakerhead i guess you can wear them i don't know how you're gonna make them look good but hey some people might be possible to do but it kind of made me think about you know in general because i've have i have a lot of strong feelings about you know sneaker photography i think it's you know for the most part it's probably the lowest common denominator of average shit that exists in the streetwear community is so crap you have to look at the stuff you see on high beast of people jumping up in slow-mo and doing that weird pin roll thing in 2020 now which you know you do, who do you see wearing pin rolls even you know long in the tooth sneakerheads don't wear pin rolls nowadays so to keep seeing that because they want to show off the shoes just cringe there's nothing innovative about it it's all the same you know regurgitate nonsense that you would have seen you know in the heydays of nike talk back in the day or crooked tongues forum it's just garbage and with that comes this weird thing where most people like i'm just trying to think of is is it possible to be a sneakerhead and be somewhat cool is that a thing or are you just destined to always be corny and be a little bit infantile minded because you're essentially collecting sneakers, which is a quote unquote a young man's game? Is that a thing? I don't too I'm not too sure because part of me will say yes because I can't think of any sneakerheads that exist in in the world who you know who would proudly call themselves that because I remember there was a time when I stopped collecting shoes or stopped buying shoes you know um you know on a regular basis where there was uh, an accepted belief that you shouldn't be telling people or showing people that you bought new shoes right it wasn't a core thing to do to be posting about the shoes you bought or your rotation or all that stuff it just wasn't even a rotation thing it had to be done like in a tasteful way like if you had like i don't know a collection of like new balances or asex shoes or something right or some undercover rebox or something yeah cool but you couldn't necessarily just show a rotation of just all jordans and nike air max it just came across a bit like what are you doing with yourself right go outside get laid you know learn, learn an instrument or something um which maybe is true maybe it's not but there is a part of me that thinks you know it's just impossible to be a sneakerhead and just not be corny like every sneakerhead person i've met or that exists on the interwebs whether it's youtubers or wherever they may be they just have this quote they just have this really you know you just feel a little bit sad for them of course you get information from what they're talking about they go through run down the shoe they do a bit of an unboxing but you don't actually want to be that person you might want the shoes to resell and flip and make some money but do you want to be his friend do you want to hang out with them like well, imagine what the conversations are like with an actual sneakerhead that still exists nowadays or well, what are they talking to you about like you know are they arguing about you know the something's not getting retro by nike like what are they doing are they complaining about colorways like it's just it just doesn't make any sense now especially when you get because i think when you're younger i had a lot of strong opinions when it came to sneakers because usually you know you didn't have a lot of disposable income and you were quite limited in the stuff that you could buy the scope of things that you're interested in especially when you're a young age you tend to go for loads of really leery stuff right so there's only a limited amount of things that you can buy there's only so many clot collabs and fucking you know soul box stuff or pat stuff that you can buy in a given year right so you're constantly fighting with everybody else for the same sort of 
loud shit then i guess when you evolve or i guess when you get older sorry um and you mature a bit your taste maybe your taste your taste maybe evolve or your palette maybe gets a little bit expanded somewhat you maybe get into other brands your style evolves a little bit too which maybe can um really push you in a different direction in terms of shoes right if you start you know if you go away from wearing i don't know baggy jeans to wear more skinnier denim it might call for a different silhouette of a shoe just your interest can just kind of evolve from there you might end up you know maybe prioritizing apparel and you know outerwear and all that other stuff more so than your the, the shoes you wear because i remember when i was a sneakerhead my wardrobe was trash like it was awful because all i wore was because all i cared about was sneakers and t-shirts that's it so if there's long my sneakers my t-shirt i was game but anything else was just an absolute afterthought and the moment i switched like my kind of my overall taste evolved and i started to get into streetwear i started to actually kind of designing stuff and in turning up brands and all this sort of stuff then all of a sudden you start to appreciate what goes into the whole thing right and then streetwear became more interesting than sneakers i would say the streetwear side of the things is a more interesting place to live in than the whole sneaker place plus you get access to different brands you end the appreciation for the form for the craft it gives a different way of design all that sort of good stuff but when you're just limited to just what you wear on your shoes what you wear on your feet it just becomes so myopic so uh, dull so corny that it just beggars belief as to why people that were in it when i was in it have still got the same amount of vigor for it that they do now i just don't i could never understand that like i just don't get it like it just doesn't make any sense and one example of this which is kind of an unfair example because by and by he seems like a bit of a you know solid dude and i remember him from the crooked tongues forum but i saw this video of hikmet from um i don't know if that's, i'm sure it's pronounced his name but um one of the founders from soulbox in germany um who you know is well known in the industry you know got some legendary collaborations in the works in the books you know assets new balances some of that the, you know, the purple tone new balance back in the day will probably some of my favorite stuff he's done but just an overall solid you know guy in the scene but i saw this video and it kind of got me thinking like number one right he's he got a video of him eating ice cream ben and Jerry's ice cream from his chunky donkey shoes and you know of course you know it's a bit of a troll you know he's probably having some fun with it but just the kind of like you know the smugness on his face when he's doing it he's obviously you knows he's going to push some buttons but you think to yourself like who's your target audience for this video who are you trying to kind of get under the skin of 16 year olds right this guy's like 50 years old or something right he's a big man he's been in the game for a long time he's got kids and shit a family it's a business for him right sneakers it's not only you know maybe back in the day when you were first starting soulbox it's an opportunity for you to kind of you know you know live your dream right collect shoes i mean uh, um own your own sneaker stores have access to all the best shoes meet all the people behind the scenes you know visit oregon go to the mb factory like all these cool things that you'd only kind of you know dream about when you're on the outside as a consumer you suddenly get to do because you're an operator in the actual industry but it must come a point that you know when it, it turns into a business right when it turns into you actually trying to kind of i guess give back maybe to the people coming underneath you for the next generation to come it it stops being a sort of one upman's thing and i guess that's the thing that for me ruined sneaker um culture for me and one in that regard too that one ups, that, that one upsmanship right the idea that that person was better than you because they had that shoe um and they kind of rub it in your face i even remember when i first got into crooked tongues and i was like 17 18 years old and you're having arguments with these people online and then later on you realize especially when i got to uni it's like wow those guys i was arguing with they were like 40 years old and you go and meet them at you know at crooked tongues meet and greets and stuff or you know the little um, gatherings they had and you're like wow these grown men were arguing with children online with vigor with kind of you know with some really heated words were being exchanged maybe some vowed threats were being you know um flung out there by the by or you know via pms or whatever it may be and you're like wow man like you just i remember when you i, I, I just to remember that was when it kind of especially when i when i was then decided to work here at night and you thought yeah and i saw how you know people went to like you know essentially just suck me off for a pair of free shoes it just got a little bit yuck i don't want to be anywhere around this and i distinctly remember being at those kind of meets um those kind of forum meets that they used to do go to a bar or when they did a sort of like i forgot that big thing they did in nike town with crooked towns where we all came and brought our shoes distinctly remembering like when i get older i don't want to be like these guys right i want to be an operator in the scene i want to be 
you know, a kind of, you know, Hiroshi Fujiwara, you know, collaborating with, with brands and stuff, but I don't want to be one of these dudes that's having to like be snarky and be a bit of a bitch and a diva to like young kids because I want to make sure I get my size eight fucking Air Max ones. You know what I mean? It's like, this is retarded. So, um, I see this video and I'm like, who is he really doing this for? Like, is he doing it for like, me like an older sneakerhead people that want or is he doing it to wind up the kids like who's this actually target demographic um here's a video of him eating an ice cream i guess he's getting the ben and jerry's and scooping it into his dunk which is you know he's more than to do is his shoe he paid good money for it do what you want in it like no one's against it but it's just he's obviously doing because this is something people used to do back in the day if it was like a cereal brand they'd like pour milk into and eat from it right and it was it was kind of like a nice a nike talk it's more of an american thing right like ha ha and then you're doing while you're eating it you got all these boxes of like you know jordans in the background so it's like you know it, this ain't nothing to me uh you know it's like that um iconic picture who's it is it fat joe looking to solve his air force ones it's that kind of idea right um I, you know do you don't pop tags you just leave it on because you know you're gonna wear it once all this sort of shit it's just you know you're obviously doing it to antagonize but in his position who you are who are you trying to antagonize like it's just doesn't come across that well and it's just like really this is what you're doing with your time okay. and seeing a grown man eat ice cream like that is really cuck in it like there's something a bit wrong with you in your head in it really in it like a grown man looking into the camera eating like that is there's something a bit off about him generally won't be surprised <laughs> to like it. And again, it's sad to see because Hickmick seems like a solid dude. I remember him back in the day and they didn't have any conversation with him. Don't get me wrong. Maybe I've bumped into him a couple of times. I've seen things, but yuck, man. Like, yuck. This is what sneakerhead is about, right? Like, being a sneakerhead, this is what it is. So it's like, maybe my kind of word to the wise for any sort of young kids out there, like, don't ever ascribe yourself an identity especially in the scene like that like a sneakerhead right try and remain cool in some capacity um if you have the feeling that you need to kind of stunt on people online because you bought something don't because it's not it's no achievement you bought a shoe congratulations keep it moving shoes are meant to be worn and enjoyed if you like sneakers and you like the shoe what they're doing with the dunks or whatever they did enjoy them wear them have some good time um if you're into girls and stuff maybe wear them and go to a club somewhere get some good compliments and you know try and use it for some kind of good um i don't know or just get compliments when you go outside as opposed to trying to wind up people on the internet it just doesn't make any sense really in it really um just disturbing really in that regard i just looked at it, i was like god damn it man no wonder i stopped referring to myself as a sneakerhead or come you know even communicating people in that industry or in that scene because it's just full of absolute weapons like that absolute weapons and that's an older man doing that and we've got tons of them in the uk there's tons of them in america probably still and um, it's just really bizarre that there's no way of kind of like growing old gracefully in the sneakhead community it always involves some kind of level of like corniness it's just like yuck like if that's your dad you're embarrassed if that's your friend you're like what are you doing you know what i mean like yeah i don't know but hey what do i know what do i know next on list here oh yeah i watched the miles davis documentary the other day that's on um bbc iplayer i recommend you check it out if you haven't already um fascinating 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 documentary uh i've got it up here on the screen let me put just a point the image actually about what i saw here let me get it up here boom yeah so just may put an image of you know the old miles davis on here but yeah um a fascinating documentary by and by um, I think a lot of interesting points I have to kind of point out regarding it that I kind of read down here for you. Do, do, do. Um, so it's an interesting documentary about you know Miles Davis, legendary jazz musician. Essentially, it's a collection of uh, short interviews and kind of you know talking head point. No, short interviews with people that are nearest and dearest to him, ex-wives and girlfriends and lovers and collaborators and muses just a whole bevy of people that kind of spanned his whole you know entire life who kind of lend their voice to the documentary and it's done in a very very tasteful way there's even parts of it where he sorts of he kind of narrates it himself i'm not sure if they're clips for the actual documentary or if it was clips that they kind of found um you know 
through basically archive footage and they basically clipped it together but it sort of reminds me a little bit of the Mike Tyson documentary where that you know he sort of like narrates his story throughout but other people sort of chip it no Mike Tyson's just him narrating it throughout but this one is sort of him narrating it in bits and other people adding in some fillers so I thought that was really really illuminating in terms of a documentary um and then there was um, of course you get to see his taste in women was impeccable I think all three of the ladies that were featured there who are kind of a couple of ex-wives and one lover I think um, but obviously the standout was Francis um, it was so awesome to just to see the importance he placed in having a partner next to him that was both a, you know an incredible lover um, was able to be somebody he could be his rock emotionally and also an inspiration in terms of the art he was doing um, and how he was creating um, they all served as muses in different sort of ways they all kind of were pivotable pivotal pivotal features people in his life right moments they kind of you know added a lot to him and if you read the actual book that I've got I think it's somewhere in my bookshelf I'm not sure if it's here maybe it's over there but in his actual book, the autobiography, Miles Davis, definitely recommend you check it out. It'll get up on your screen so you can see it. But he's got an autobiography, Miles Davis, autobiography. And in the autobiography, he does mention often that he that's the one part, I think, of his life that he regrets, you know, being a bit of a shitty dad and being, you know, a bit of a terrible husband and boyfriend to his partners. He mentions that quite often. Um of, and thinking about it it kind of reminded me a little bit of the Jordan documentary Last Dance right his relentless pursuit for you know um, perfection in sports you know his relentless pursuit for excellence and for greatness and you know ultimately to win trophies um, individual accolades and team accolades maybe was um, maybe did have some neg negative effects with his personal relationships with people on and off the court, right? Whether it's family members or teammates, you saw saw that throughout the entire documentary, right? It's it's to a fault, but people were willing to accept it because he was just so great in this other domain, right? When it came to kind of you know playing basketball on the bigger stage under the bright lights, when it really mattered, he was the guy you wanted to go to. He was what Americans refer to as clutch, right? He was the guy that you wanted the buzzer, you know seconds on a buzzer and you need one you need three points to win a championship you give the ball to Jordan and he's going to do what he's going to do so Miles Davis probably had a bit of that too right he's always been referred to as a musical savant he was you know what leading an orchestra when he was like fucking 14 15 years of age like always kind of you know seen as a bit of a um a special talent in that regard so having that level of gift given to you and artistry and talent and ability at that young age and that kind of single-minded pursuit of knowing exactly where you're going and how you're going to do it is definitely going to affect other parts of your life it's just impossible to be well-rounded when you're that person it seems like when you look at some of the autobiographies of people who operate on that level of greatness it's just really difficult to kind of have all your you know to kind of have everything in in perfect balance if that's even a thing it's just hard to do some things have to fall by the wayside and you kind of saw that featured in a documentary and you definitely see that featured in the book i recommend check out the book probably read the book first if you can um but if you if not then definitely check out the documentary it's only like an hour and a half no it's actually two hours but it's really enjoyable it doesn't matter check it out you've got no, nothing else to do anyway so obviously during lockdown um and then another point in it I mentioned here, um, it's a cautionary tale of how drugs and alcohol can ruin a career in the arts. And that is true in the in every case, right? From the Keith Richards book I have here, Stephen Tyler autobiography book that I've read. Um, anyone involved in the in the arts, entertainment industry, anytime they went through any kind of hardship where they had to resort to drugs and alcohol in order to kind of numb the pain, in order to make you know the pain go away, to sort of like you know um, make the days go by quickly it inevitably led to a moment where it was really hard to sort of like wean yourself off of it especially when you've been operating at such a high frequency because like anything in life i think the you know just trying to get your foot in the door trying to get started is really difficult in anything you do especially in the arts right because there's no real clear path to anything to become a pop star to become the next ariana grande or to become an next big dj there is no real clear path like you do this 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 it's all you know it's a bit of a it's a bit of a snake it's a bit you know up and down everyone's got a different journey um so with that comes this idea that once you've 
finally got some momentum stuff does become big stuff gets really easy once you get your foot in the door it becomes a little bit easier to kind of navigate opportunities kind of present themselves to you most successful people say it you'll say that all the time right it's not necessarily about how hard you work once you get there it's about the work you do at the beginning right it's like kind of like grinding 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 on the underground and then you get given the opportunity because someone called in sick and all this stuff happens and then suddenly now all that work you've done with no one was noticing it's going to be important now because when people notice they've got that reference of the material you've done previously you've obviously got like a uh you know you've been operating that level for a while so it would only be it would only make sense once you get to that level that you know you'd be indulged somewhat you know because you've kind of you know you've shown improved and also you know you can get away with it because you've done it before you've done it at a lower level you know turning stuff in late or just you know whatever just getting on it being high drinking a lot and it's been okay for you at that low level so when you get higher level and you've got kind of assistance and you've got teams around you it only makes sense that what's a bit of free time that you can maybe dabble you know in some extracurricular activities but unfortunately when it comes to achieving great things or being great at your craft it just doesn't mix there's no one that exists out there i don't think so from what i've read and i've read a lot extensively about people who have been successful in the entertainment industry or in the you know in music um in design in fashion in, in contemporary art it, it doesn't exist a person who's able to operate on that level of frequency um do great work and also have you know these uncontrollable vices especially when it comes to drugs alcohol just you know and just indulge in it willy nilly as long as they want. It's just not a thing. You might be, you know, you might be an occasion where you, you, you know, you win a big prize, you secure a sponsorship, you get a new contract, whatever it may be, and you celebrate cool. But consistently getting out, getting on it when you're trying to pursue a really lofty goal is just no bueno. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to work. And usually it kind of blows up in your face somewhere or the other, whether it's, you know, you know, everyone finding out about Tiger Woods, you know, hordes of, you know, Swedish models getting unloaded off a, off a coach somewhere, whatever stuff that happens privately behind the scenes you don't hear about with certain celebrities, it never ever goes unnoticed. It's, it's definitely going to come and bite in the ass. And you saw it with, you know, with essentially Miles Davis, you know, with his excessive, I guess you'd say in that area was different, but, you know, he smoked a lot, drank a lot. He had an ulcer that needs, a non-cancerous ulcer that needs to be removed from his um, throat, I'm pretty sure, which affected his voice, which completely changed how he sounded. He had sort of had this raspy voice that he never had before. Uh, more well, more raspy than maybe what it had been. His excessive use of heroin and cocaine probably affected his respiratory issues, which then affected him, you know, being able to play the trumpet later on in life, which then led to him essentially dying of a heart attack. You know, all these things led to it. But um, a part of me also was like thinking, watching it, you know what? He did live a life worth living, even though, you know, he did succumb to you know the effects of maybe getting um a bit too happy with the party drugs um uh, in his life or whenever he had like a bad moment because you also have to remember you watch a documentary every every time each time he had a bit of a stumbling block and he kind of came out of it from the other side he sort of came out of from a you know a binge and sort of tried to get his life together was when some of his best work well some of his best work was created so there's a kind of a give and take in that regard especially when you're high operating on that level of frequency but there's also this idea that maybe these incredibly talented and gifted people who are kind of like you know uh provided to us as sources of kind of um fun inspiration and maybe motivation they're sort of a bit of a cautionary tale for us and maybe for themselves maybe um whoever kind of gives them the gifts whether you believe in a you know a, a higher power or it's god or whatever it may be whoever creates these people sorts of gives them these sort of flaws so that they can keep their ego in check themselves and that it gives us a cautionary tale as to hey this person might be perfect in some regards but there are some faults in their character there are some things that you can learn from that you can sh that you shouldn't be copying when it comes to your future and the stuff that you do maybe there's something in that i think because it's a common thread you see with and loads of musicians with loads of people in the arts and entertainment industry it's just you know 
they just have that kind of self-destructive streak in them where they can kind of just really implode on themselves you know at any moment and everyone just has to be along with a ride and just kind of hold on tight because that's part of their genius right you notice that straight away with watching the Miles Davis documentary um, a fascinating fascinating documentary I really recommend you check it out it's on iPlayer now if you're in the UK but I'm sure if you are outside the UK you'll be able to find it um, if you do a bit of digging but yeah definitely one of my um, favourite documentaries I've watched in a long long time and like uh, amazingly done who's it directed by so here's yeah Miles Davis The Birth of the Call um, it's directed by Stanley Nelson Jr. Really, really well done. Um, only people that were you know directly involved with him speak on the issue. No kind of like fluffy people are involved in it. Um, a really done, well, well done piece. Like loads of unseen pictures that you haven't checked, you haven't seen before of his. Especially if you read the autobiography, you know there's loads of pictures in the autobiography book that I've actually got. Um, this one here. So if you've read that book, don't think you've seen all the pictures of Miles Davis. Loads of unearthed ones are going to be in this documentary as well. Um, Birth of the Core. So yeah, check it out if you haven't already. Really, really good viewing for your little inspiration boost. Next one on this, what do we have here? Um, oh, I also watched Ronin um, this weekend. Actually, that was a really interesting movie that I watch, um, mostly because of the car scene. It kind of gets featured a lot. You see it um, always shared on Twitter and stuff, and people are showing images and gifts of it. But quite easily, maybe, you know, two or three car chases in it were maybe the best car chases I've seen in film in a long time the driving was insane I'm trying to go and I was actually going to look up who the stunt drivers were who did this movie because bloody hell can they whip these cars around man BMWs Peugeots it's just epic epic driving and you just see how fun it is to drive a manual transmission car man like throughout the streets of Paris the fact that it's just and again there is something um it's, it's undeniable just how captivating inspirational Paris is to, um, you know, people, especially in film. It's just, there's something about it you can't really put into words, isn't it? And I know for myself, you know, I was somebody that kind of poo-pooed Paris and wasn't necessarily, I didn't really get it. But I think whenever you attach something to Paris, where it's a kind of, um, um, a sh I don't know, you're going to kind of access some sort of like scene or show. I think it kind of adds to it. So when I went there for fashion week, that's when it suddenly kind of came to life and I kind of got it because you kind of react to the energy of the people around you, right? They are like, when I went to Paris for fashion week, it was like the Super Bowl for fashion. Like you could tell people were taking it seriously. They turned out for it, right? They were really going for it. Outfits and photographers and just stylists and handlers and people around milling. It's just the energy was in electrifying. And I was like, ah, this is the Paris that they speak about. And then as soon as I left the show and I started wandering around the back streets of Paris and found little random bars and um and cafes to go and sit down and people watch i kind of really really got it because i think the previous times i've been especially when you go with your parents and stuff it's not the same you don't necessarily get the feel of a place you're just a bit you're a bit of a passenger you know you know you know you're just a spectator actually you're not actually experiencing anything but the moment you sort of attach something to it you may be going for a, you know a, an objective you're going with a crowd a crew you're going to see something be a part of something i'd imagine if you went to go you know watch fucking slip not playing paris would be a, an amazing experience too in that regard it's just something about that place man and watching ronin definitely kind of got me thinking about you know the beauty of paris and just why it's such an important how it's how such an important place it, such an important uh part it plays in the history of film right like what would Paris? what would the movie industry be without paris like honestly some of the uh, you know just legendary movies that have taken place in those little streets man it's just captivating to see man so yeah I recommend you check it out ronin um it's a i don't know it's coming out in 1998 it's a really old movie but it's a really fascinating movie the plot of it isn't that great but this the cinematography of the thing is just insane man great great driving probably some of the best driving scenes i've seen in the movie in a long 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 time so definitely check it out if you haven't already do, 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 do. what else is on the list here that i want to speak about oh another cool thing i saw if you want to check out a cool episode or podcast is this series a podcast presented by tigger one of those legendary electro people from back in the day i'm sure you remember he's still around now playing techno and all that good stuff but he's got this uh, podcast called tigger presents first and last party on earth um and it says the following it's a kind of a bio on it right it says here um 
Tigger will fully exploit his status as friend and confident to some of the world's most uh, some of the world's top DJs to ask what is it ultimately certainly the ultimate DJ question it's your first and last set ever what do you play as guests Carl Cox Annie Mack Pete Tong and more share their ultimate opening tracks Pete Tan bombs and tear drinking closes they'll they will whether they will whether they will realize or not share something sensual about themselves and their craft each episode will reflect on the arc and flow of the magical dj fantasy night itself with musical interludes mixing seriously with vital as f examinations of mortality uh, creativity and the very nature of vibe itself this will be without question the most danceable interview podcast ever downloaded so yeah I recommend you check it out it's really enjoyable um the fact that they add the little interludes of the tunes is cool he obviously goes through the entire set of what they think will be a good um you know dj set for the first and last party they do and um so yeah some really cool interviews that i've listened to previously yeah, he did one what would that what wouldn't i enjoy the seth chocolate ones obviously really interesting but the latest one i watched was or listened to sorry was miss kitten um which came out i think on the 13th of may so I recommend you check out one of really legendary um you know electro dj she spoke about her transition from electro to techno the scene back then it just kind of got me thinking you know the nostalgia you know of how it was back in the day um that scene was just incredible coming up is and that was kind of the peak of when you know music bloggers still existed and people's opinions mattered on those kind of platforms and stuff and those tiny little shows and you know all blue last and shack alarms and shit it was just fucking Oh, such a good time but yeah recommend you check it out man it's a really cool series it's called ticket presents first and last party on earth available on all your standard podcasting platforms man. a really well done podcast very well produced by tigger so definitely give him some love if you haven't seen that yet uh and then let's get into some other shit on here what else i want to say uh, What's on? Okay, cool. Let's see this. So these are new shoes are coming out. Um, Sakai collaboration. This is probably what the third iteration, third, fourth, maybe third, or for race. Yeah, I think third iteration of the Sakai Nike collaborations, where they essentially fuse different the same shoe on top of each other you know with this sort of like amazing um amalgamation of just you know sneakers and midsoles and uppers and swoosh she has and tongues and laces just complete um you know just 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 a complete jambalaya of madness on a shoe probably again but for someone like myself who's a big fan of triple s's and just loves that kind of gargantuan you know unruly nutty looking piece of footwear these are right up my alley and this is a look um at the what third iteration i'd say of what they've done previously um this is provided by hypebeat so take a look at the first look at the sakai nike Waff, vapor waffle game royale and sport fusion you can't go wrong with these sort of classic colorways on like an you know 70s 80s nike running shoe upper you can't go wrong with it right of you know inspired sorry upper you can't go wrong you know the kind of off-white color with the red swoosh and the blue accents and red accents just absolutely perfectly done and just looks mad as fuck um you've got the addition of this crazy soul at the back right here which is kind of a cue from the vapor fly if you've worn a vapor fly you know what they look like it's all got this mad sort of like mad thing at the back and it's super exposed here it's not sure what they're going to do so i'm not sure how this is passed any sort of q qc quality control issues in terms of this is it going to fall off and stuff i'm not too sure but it's been a while and it have i'm not sure anyone's newer nike shoes sole falls off anymore that's not a thing i like the fact that there's no banana foot on the sole here you've got the nice flat profile on the toe book which is something that i've kind of longed for on nike retros or shoes that they make nowadays so that's great to see you've got the double laces and then you've got obviously uh you see the gap here on the heel and of course the sole it's just but it's just nuts to look at i just love everything about it now text again from hype please quickly go through this see if they've got new information it's a standing as one of the highly anticipated sneakers of the year we now have the first look at another nike color the nike uh, sakai nike vaporfly the latest take is the fourth colorway we have seen and expresses a standout mix of sail light blue bone game royale and sports fusion the highly conceptual footwear style continues designer chis chisob 
I was to say Abbe. Abbe's penchant for hybrid design with an upper that melds elements of two high performance pieces of Nike running shoes. The deconstruction fueled aesthetic creates an extremely complex layered structure accented by double midfoot swooshes, dual tongue, dual tongue tags, stacked printed branding, and interweaved interwined laces. Elevating the shoe is a layered sole unit that are defined by an aggressive lip. Um, at the heel of the shoe so yeah definitely big triple s energy in that regard you know soul on soul on soul on soul but jesus christ this is done on a high high level these are so good and again th th this is another rare example of a shoe that's going to be very popular with resellers and also very popular with people just like to wear trainers with their with their fits you know what i mean um so expect these to be very hard to get a hold of because when when those two forces collide you know when you get those people that listen to fucking gq style podcasts and kids that um you know wank on uh you know at the bottom of comments on drop date it's going to be an absolute horror show for everybody else in between it's going to be a horror show so get your bots ready get your links and your plug ready and try and see if you can get a pair because wow it's going to be it's going to be grim out there when these drop and they're meant to come out when no idea no dates on them summer 2020 it says 180 dollars supposedly so let's see let's see actually i want to see what the actual other colorways of them are let me see if they've got any more because I, I forgot what the other one colorways were because they were debuted at uh fashion week got it previously so let me see what the other colorways are I said we've seen three, but I've not seen that many of them. Let me see what I'd be saying on this search part. Let's see if we've got any other colorways. We've got that one first. Any other ones here? No, no other colorways listed. Okay, that's all we've got so far. But hey, at least we know they're coming. So, um, what else is on the list here? Do, 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 do. Maybe have a view of what's happening. Um, Bank holiday weekend. Um. Did you go out during bank holiday weekend? Did you? I didn't. I'm not really bothered. Don't really give a shit. Um, but BBC News put up this um, interesting piece in pictures. UK heads outdoors for bank holiday sunshine. Now, is, are they trying to shame people because they went outside or just, just like, an, you know, uh, responsible reporting um, during this uh, pivotal moment in, in human history? Who knows? But, um, yeah, people in the UK love their bank holiday weekends. Usually it's an escape from work, right? Because, you know, people usually, you know, people in the UK or people in most Western countries hate their nine to fives. So any any kind of respite they get from having to turn up to work and answer to an absolute dickhead of a boss, they're going to take it. So bank holiday weekends are popular. And then you get an opportunity to chill out, relax, take your, take your foot off the pedal and enjoy some quality family time. But I guess with coronavirus lockdown, bank holiday weekends have maybe taken a different level of significance now because you know the things that you took for granted are kind of been taken away from you so you've got nothing but time and nothing but an opportunity to reconnect with your family and friends or just go around just get out of the house and see some strangers right there is something to be said for that people like to go on especially in the uk people like to go on as if like you know anytime you get near them um you're going to in time you get near them is a is a is an opportunity for them to run away and scream um they want this personal space right we're all about that usually outside of you know central line stations no one comes near anybody but we do miss having you know having just people around strangers because you know we're so densely populated in this little city of london that you kind of miss the idea of the rush every day in the morning getting to work or you know going to a bar queuing up at weatherspoons going to a restaurant somewhere going to a cinema it's just so many people everywhere that you kind of miss that electricity that you kind of get off other people even just even even if you're not going to go anywhere just hanging around um you kind of miss that so i guess when bank holiday weekend comes around you're like you know what f this i don't care let's go to cornwall let's go to devon let's go to bristol brighton all these places no, maybe not bristol let's go to brighton maybe and go and sunbathe hang out and the weather in london this weekend was amazing too so i don't blame anyone for doing it and this is a little essay i guess a little pictorial reporting from bbc it says here the bank of the weekend has been some has some mixed weather but as the sun emerged many in the uk took the opportunity to make sure make the most of the lockdown easing and take a day trip so it's what crowds flock to beaches in bournemouth to enjoy the sun which is you know fair enough and they get your sun do your thing but that doesn't look like a fun beach there not a lot not a man of social distancing which 
again, I don't have a problem with. I think a lot of these people are making informed decisions around about their weekend. I think a lot of these people are aware because I think it's impossible not to be aware of the science and the numbers and the information out there. You just have to make an informed decision and just take a kind of calculated risk and be like, you know what, I want to get a tan. I don't care. I'm going to go outside. If I get COVID, I get it. I guess people are doing that decision. And for people like myself who are too afraid to go out and get it, you know, I don't think I've always I've mentioned before, but no amount of beach time is worth me laying up in the hospital for like you know 10 weeks or so like i'm just it's just not worth it um so i'd rather just stay in until everything kind of settles down but hey if you want to do it then you're f more than welcome to and as you can see from this picture there's an abundance of caucasians out on this beach you don't really see anybody else on there apart from that so you know that might have to that might that might say something or say nothing who knows uh, another image here i see suggested that ahead of the weekend that nearly two thirds of UK drivers did not intend to get into their car for leisure purposes over the bank holiday with predictions that it could turn out to be the quietest. And, I'm not too sh and again, I don't know how, how much does this play into the idea that, you know, if the leaders aren't, if people in government aren't taking it seriously, then, you know, how do you expect the public to, how do you police, how do you kind of prevent people from going out and enjoying the sun when Dominic Cummins is making, you know, 260 mile round trips to see his family because he's afraid he's got a flu. Like, I don't know, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, another image here of people, where is this? Um, with temperatures expected to reach 25 degrees, Celsius in London and the southeast, many headed to the coast, such as South End on the Sea. Again, doesn't look like the most, you know, doesn't look like Marbella, but I get it, fair enough. Um, the need to just be around people is strong, right? It kind of reminds me of, have you ever been that, have you ever had that moment where you're walking down the street and you walk on one side and suddenly someone that's walking on the other side gets drawn to where you're walking and then you have to kind of swap over it's like there's all that room but i guess there's something there's a magnetism between people where you're just kind of drawn to kind of like walking towards where the crowd is it's just always annoying that happens but hey maybe that's what these people have right they're just all kind of drawn towards the sea and there's a weird conspiracy not conspiracy theory, but it's this, there's this idea that you know going to the seaside and take getting some sun kind of kills the virus and maybe some ocean air is good for your lungs and respiratory <sighs> it's just yeah i don't know i don't know where to start with that if the science is solid if it's not hey sometimes you know sometimes um those kind of folk tales are good for the soul in it so you know if, if you believe it fair enough do your thing again a gaggle of caucasians walking there oh no there's a black guy here actually madness look there's one black guy taking pictures of course with his saddlebag on there but here's another gaggle of white people walking down the hill so that after after prime minister boris johnson defended his chief staff dominic cummings that name and cummings you know madgate um decision to travel to county durham during lockdown there were fears members of the public would gather in the coronavirus mission was less seriously uh, this is a beautiful where's this beach there um don't know what that is with the promise of bank uh, loads of people in england continue to advise the public to adhere to the guidelines of stay alert that looks actually gorgeous oh look guy here's got us the new supreme bag as well nice little spot there many people in weymouth sitting outside where's this it's a long walk in windsor hanging out white people everywhere not a mask in sight which is again really disappointing because you would hope if people want to go outside and have a good time you know enjoy the sun that they would adhere to some 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 of the little you know, some of the precautions you know social distance wear a mask like, that's the least you can do if you really do want to go outside and have some fun right and get your tan on right eat some fish and chips you know stare at people that look like you and then walk back home you would Im you would imagine you'd want to you know make sure that you're not going home in a fucking you know in an ambulance and just put a mask on it's just all you have to do really but there's just such a they've been turned to such a political debate that it's become really really um annoying to see that isn't it like it's just a easy preventable measure that you can place and again there's a lot of kind of a uh, um, what's I think called wearing it together sort of thing vibe with it too it's not just the fact that you're wearing it to limit your freedoms you're doing it as a kind of sign to everybody else like a silent nod right it's like whenever black people see other black people in different countries that like, well go on you know the pain you know what I mean they know the pain worldwide but hey Caucasian is going to Caucasian isn't it a normally busy coastal hotspot in Wales such as Pro, what's that Porf Call whatever that's called has been quiet Again, white people jumping over pieces of string. I don't know. It's just a madness, isn't it? Absolute madness. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say about this, and it really. I have no interest to go to any beach in the UK anyway, generally in my day-to-day life. So to, you know, to suddenly, it's like all these people that decided this, they're fucking Lance Armstrong during the lockdown and everyone's riding bicycles now. Everyone's pretending they're fucking, you know, fucking runners, you know. Everyone's a jogger now in the morning, clogging up space, taking up room. Like, get out of here, man. I didn't see you jogging back in March, back in February. Now all of a sudden everyone's got running shoes and is cycling with fucking, you know, I don't know, tore the front wanker kits and shit, but hey, what do I know? What do I know? Anyway, it's mixed move on here. Da, 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 da. What else we want to talk about? Oh, there's news that supposed to be Spain is reopening in July to tourists with no quarantine. So if you're really desperate to get your rave on, if you've kind of been anxious to go out and get on it, have a little bit of a boogie, this might be your opportunity to do so. This is news from Resident Advisor. It says Spain to allow foreign visitors from July with no quarantine. We will guarantee the tourists will not run any risk and they will not bring any risk here, says Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez on Saturday. That's a big statement. Do you really want to put that quote out there like that? I don't know, man, because that, that's, some, that's some final last word shit in it. Final last words um, shit in it, really, you think. That's something that's going to come and bite you back in the ass. But hey, maybe he knows something we don't. So this article from President Biden says, Spain is opening its borders to international visitors from July with no required quarantine period. In a televised address on Saturday, May 23rd, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez confirmed that the foreign tourism will return in safe conditions, he says here, right? He says, we will guarantee the tourists will not run any risk if they don't bring up any risk. Well, that's, that sounds like Irish. I'm not going to do accent. That sounds that sounds kind of Irish. Max is a bit shit there. He says that there'll be no opposing forces between health and business. Spanish tourism will now have two hallmarks, environmental sustainability and health safety. Don't know what that means. Though. Uh, it says, this appears to be a good news for Spanish clubs and promoters, many of which will rely on tourism, particularly in the summer months. That said, it's still unclear when clubs and venues will reopen. So tourists can come, but there's clubs. I don't know. I wonder what the numbers are at some tourists. Like, how, what amount of tourists go to Spain, primarily just for the beaches and the sangria and the... F- and the food, right? And what amount of tourists go to Spain for the party season? I wonder what it is. Maybe, of course, because I think, you know, festive party, what's it? Um, Ibiza season runs probably longer than maybe summer holidays, I'd, I'd imagine. Um, which, but it's good for them anyway out there because I think there was a big drive for them to maybe say that winter was a new summer, right? There was a kind of a marketing campaign put together by people involved in the Ibiza nightlife scene. So maybe there is some sort of juice they can squeeze out of it. Like I mentioned previously, I think quite a lot of the places in Spain, especially in Ibiza for the most part, have a sort of like outdoor terrace vibe. So they might be able to kind of... Exp- um, take advantage of that loophole where they could have more people outside quote unquote than indoors right because i don't think clubs are going to be open in the way that they were open previously until probably about next year because the insurance and the liability there and just the risk involved in putting an event in a closed room and confined area like what happened in south korea right where that one person went to a club and ended up kind of infecting 40 people um it's not worth the risk isn't it so they're gonna probably get around it by doing these sort of like open air things so if you've got like a place where a dj plays under a roof but then you've got a dance floor that extends outside you can effectively have more people in your open air party but it's still indoors that could probably be a way around it i think so um it says here it continues the quote it says of course we are happy about the opening of the country a foreigner says uh gerardo neva founder of madrid party mondo he says it's a good start and means that the situation is getting better in europe at the moment we don't have much info about how this improvement will affect clubs events let's hope for more good news soon so i guess if you want to go out and you're really desperate for it and you can do that i'd imagine you know I'd, personally i would say probably lay off of it and wait until things settle down um if you do want to go on holiday just get some sun fair play but going to a foreign country just so you can go into a, you know a crowded room of strangers doesn't make sense right now given what's happening you're probably better off just you know going and enjoying yourself at some sort of jazz cafe somewhere grabbing a drink eating some good food getting a tan and coming back that way or just not going anywhere until things you know 
get where they need to be. But for the promoters out there, it's a great sign for them. They've got some some sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Again, depends how you spin it, depends what they do. I guess the economy in Spain has suffered a bit as well, so there might be some leniency and some bending of the rules and some reducing of the red tape yeah. to allow some things to open up here and there. But again, I'm not too sure what the kind of sentiment, because the problem with these things is like, I'm sure the industry, right, and the people involved will find a way to make it work, right? They're going to do what they can do to make sure the club is running and it's safe and all that malarkey, but you can't really count for the overall sentiment and the feeling of the public. Like, will they be up for going out? Will people want to be in clubs so soon? Because I think at the end, when it's kind of feels like it's over, I think there'll be an overly, there'll be an, uh, a need to just celebrate and just let go and just forget about what everything's going on and just kind of celebrate life right with strangers with family and friends but now it feels a bit soon and it june july it just feels a bit premature um you would think a celebration would come sometime at the end of the year where everyone you know we all kind of had in the back of our heads that life would probably return to normal sometime before christmas right let's say september to be safe so but then to suddenly have people opening stuff in june july football's coming back and open markets in the uk just feels a little bit premature that's the only thing i'll say about it but you know if these people were experts think they've dealt with well i think spain have done a good job for the most part they've man they've, it's a mandatory mask had to be worn when you're outdoors so they probably have con controlled it in some way shape or form they've increased testing so those things could probably help so they probably might not be in a bad situation as we are here in the uk but it would be really weird to see the uk you know four weeks later copying spain and suddenly opening places up when you know we have some of the highest number of deaths in you know in europe for the most part i think we're second to the u.s still now aren't we um but yeah good luck to what's going on in spain hopefully they figure it out man because you know have had a good lot of good memories you know visiting that little country primavera madrid you know all very enjoyable times for me um what else is on the list here ba, 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 ba. i talked about zakai I talked about that didn't i oh and lastly this is an interesting story this is about a park in brooklyn that's in that's introduced maybe that's maybe a, a view of the new future you know uh, so a view of the new normal there's something that we've kind of all kind of come to grips with with the covid and the coronavirus lockdown we we're aware that our lives are going to be changed maybe for the better maybe f maybe for the worse but definitely for good in some way shape or form for the next 18 months or so there's going to be some residual effects some ptsd socially that's going to affect us all and i guess it's up to urban planners city officials designers um to get creative and figure out solutions to make that shit work and i guess um they've done this in brooklyn so it says here white circles promote social distancing in domino's park in new york city it says the grass of new york's domino park has been painted with white circles to encourage public to stay safe safely safely apart during the pandemic located in brooklyn's williamsburg neighborhood the waterfront park is one of the first cities to divert devise a way to implementing social distancing by six 1.8 meters a procedure recommended by to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus the design which is created on friday 15th of may comprises of a series of white circles applied with chalk paint onto the plot of astral turf or artificial grass they mark out the circles for groups of individuals to sit inside <sighs> dystopian and it? it's it's obviously similar to the pictures or videos i showed the other day of people raving in munster in germany and um, in these little circles and again like do I really need to be outside that badly to sit in a circle like that away from people? Especially with, I guess, each circle is a household or, you know, a group of friends that have been around each other for the most of the time during lockdown. I imagine so. But I just, I would much rather things go back to normal so I can run around in the park than having to sit in a circle outside. It just, you know, it feels like, it, it feels like hell. It feels like a nightmare. But again, maybe I'm saying this from the outside and maybe if I go there, I'd, like, I'd enjoy it. But, this doesn't look like a future that I want to be anywhere near, to be honest. Um, it continues, the Domino Park staff came up with the design of the circles and two employment employees sorry, spent four hours painting them. There are approximately 30 circles arranged symmetrically in rows and each is eight feet in diameter. 
Um, so it's a pretty big circle to be fair you can fit a few friends in there as public uh, begins to flock the parks and the city the weather warms the concept is intended to keep patrons apart from one another it's also relatively cheap and quick in concept to implement it reminds me of you know it reminds me a bit of like skater stoppers on benches right they're sort of a weird way to stop skaters from grinding on a bench and also a way to kind of keep people separate and don't get weirded out because someone's sitting next to you close to you on a bench or something isn't it it's just a little bit I don't know man this herding of society into these shapes and these forms you kind of want to give you kind of want to give us the illusion that we're free we know we're not right we know we're being surveillance we're under surveillance you know 24 7 the government's tapped our phones um sometimes depending on you know our socioeconomic background our life is sort of like predetermined for us right before we've even kind of stepped out of our mother's womb but jesus christ man like is this really what we want like i don't know um and it says here it took a total this is a quote it took a total in total it took a few 90 99 cents cans of white chalk paint from the local paint store two people in four hours to implement the strategic implement of urbanization said domino park the visitors started using them properly almost immediately which is great to see people actually you know taking lessons and using them i guess if you did this in victoria park there'll be loads of tins all around people you know in the uk are just fucking gross no one will pay attention to this if it's happened at vicky park but you know we'd like to hopefully get proved it wrong i'd like to see someone just do this themselves in victoria park and see if people actually abide by it but hey um says the circles are among a number of measures that domino park is using to encourage people to stay safe blah 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 but yeah loads of different implementations they're going there but fuck me man I don't know if that's something I want to be part of personally. I want to just love to get back to normal, to some level of normality. Then I'll go enjoy a park. But to go to a park like this or to having to be walking through and viewing people like this just looks like hell to me, man. It's like a bad episode of Bad Mirror, Black Mirror or something. But hey, what do I know? Maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments if you disagree with it. But I wouldn't want to live anywhere in a world anywhere like this, man. I want to be able to go into a park on what you, and what you meant to do if you have a ball you meant to like you could kick up inside a little circle you meant to do push-ups inside a little circle it just doesn't make any sense not to me no thank you anyway that's where i end it that's the excellent english show episode number 317 as per usual feature first time listening please smash that like button click subscribe and leave me know in the comments if you enjoyed the show uh you can more information about myself you can add me on the socials which can be found down below too instagram um facebook no instagram and twitter mostly i don't use facebook anymore so don't worry about that one um if you want to connect with me in any other way via email be able to show the link there down there below too via the website excellentzinger.com click the contact you'll be able to email me through there but just reach out to me on socials if you want if you're listening via the social uh, the podcast app actually please make sure you share and leave me a five-star review if you can that'll be great and until then i'll see you guys very very soon take care be safe bye